Hi, I'm Toby Bell. I'm a senior lecturer here at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm Donna Whelan and I just completed my PhD here at Monash. In this video, we'll be talking about our recent Perspectives article to be published in Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters on single molecule localization microscopy. Single molecule localization microscopy is an easy method to understand and to get going, but we've come to appreciate that it's tricky to do right and in a genuinely meaningful way. The underlying principle of single molecule localization microscopy is very straightforward and is based on the temporal separation of fluorescent emissions of single molecules. To do this, the sample is manipulated so that the fluorophores blink, that is, they switch between emissive and non-emissive states. On the left is a typical epifluorescence image of some immunostained microtubules. In the second panel, the majority of fluorophores have been successfully switched to a dark state using a reducing buffer so that only clear diffraction limited emission patterns from single molecules are present. Thousands of images are collected, each with a different subset of molecules in the emissive state. Each frame is then analysed with single molecule point spread functions fitted to localise the emitter's position to within a few nanometers. The coordinates of every emitter thus determined are then plotted to generate the final super resolution image. So this is the setup that we do single molecule localization microscopy with. It's an inverted fluorescence microscope capable of detecting emission from single molecules. Excitation is provided by continuous wave diode lasers. We've got blue, green and red and each of these can provide about 1 to 200 milliwatts. The light from the lasers is steered around and collected on these dichroic mirrors here and brought to this mirror here. These lenses here allow us to expand the beam and then focus it to the back focal plane of the objective. Light comes off another dichroic and into the sample which is mounted on top here. Fluorescence from the sample is collected back through the same objective and then steered around onto one or both of these EMCCD cameras here. One advantage to building a custom setup such as this is that it can be modified, added to and expanded as time goes on. Putting these optics here on this translation stage allows us to take advantage of the turf objective we have under here and achieve a highly inclined or quasi-turf illumination arrangement. And this can really improve data quality. Okay, so in terms of actually taking a measurement, assuming that you've got something that is well fixed and well stained, for example, these uh, multi-well chambers here are holding fixed COS7 cells that have been immunostained for microtubules and, and stained with Alex 647, which we know blinks very well when you add a reductant. Uh, you just put it onto the microscope. You have a hunt around until you find something that looks like it's worth imaging. So these are very nice microtubules that we found. And then all you have to do is turn the laser up. Um, and by doing that, what you'll start to see after just a few seconds is really nice blinking of your sample. Um, you let that run for about 10 to 15,000 frames, and then you process that using one of several openly available software suites. So once you've got enough frames, we're using RapidStorm, and you can just drag your TIFF stack straight in and hit run. And that will immediately start to localize these single molecule emissions and plot them onto the final image. Uh, in the beginning, it's a little bit difficult to see anything, but once you zoom in and enough molecules have been localised, you start to see microtubules becoming apparent. Here we have a zoomed in section of the final super resolution image and the same area from the epifluorescence image for comparison. The gain in resolution is clear, as you can see from the cross sections of microtubules, which are well inside the diffraction limit at around 50 to 60 nanometers. This is about right once the width of the microtubule, the size of the immunolabels, and the localization precision are taken into account. And one of the big advantages about imaging a known structure such as microtubules is that you can use it to benchmark your microscope and to see how it and your sample are performing. To see how much the resolution is improved, we can take the same cross section from the epifluorescence image and see directly that the microtubules we are resolving in the super res image are completely obscured within the diffraction limit. In the article, we also discuss several different kinds of sample measurement and rendering based artifacts and show how they can be detected using a known structure such as microtubules. For example, axial and lateral drift artifacts and the errors caused by inputting an incorrect point spread function or pixel size. Artifacts related to label density are also very important. Insufficient labels will lead to discontinuous features while too many will cause a blurring effect. By understanding and testing for these artifacts, much more reliable single molecule localization images can be obtained. 
So that's single molecule localization microscopy in a nutshell. We hope we've convinced you that it's a very approachable and very powerful technique. And we hope you've enjoyed our presentation and hope you enjoy reading our paper and that it encourages you to utilize single molecule localization microscopy in your own research, perhaps even implement it in your own laboratory.